for the formal welcome. Okay, so welcome everybody to the Ocean County Historical Society's temporarily virtual speaker series. As our regulars know, we usually host these at our museum in Tom's River, but it's been a while due to the pandemic, so we are still online. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Melissa Ziobro and I am a trustee of the Historical Society. I happen to be hosting these talks for now, but honestly, that's the easy part. There are people who do the heavy lifting behind the scenes with all of the logistics, especially Barbara Roish and Richard and Mickey Kuntz. So thank you to everyone who makes these lovely events happen. I have just a few housekeeping announcements that I am tasked with before we dive into today's program. Please note that, as I mentioned, today's program is being recorded and will be available for playback on our YouTube channel in case you are more comfortable keeping your camera off or anything. Today's speaker series, like so many of our events, is free, but we do rely on your donations to keep us going and to continue our mission telling the stories of Ocean County. We'd like you to know that you can donate from the safety and convenience of your own home via our website, oceancountyhistory.org. You can also sign up to be a member of the Historical Society there. Perks include our award-winning newsletter, early registration and discounts on some programs and more, all outlined on our website. Please know that we are open, both the museum and research center. You can find ours and all other necessary information on our website as well. I'd also like to remind you that we are on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. So please follow us on the platform of your choice or on all. Now, a little more about some upcoming events. The Ocean County Historical Society will be touring St. Vladimir Memorial Church on Tuesday, September 28th at 10 a.m. The tour will be conducted by Mark Mutter, a church member and a member of the Ocean County Historical Society. You must provide your own transportation. Please see our website for more information. Then on October 10th at 2 p.m., we are back with our virtual speaker series. Next up is Russell Dutcher, who will be discussing the Dutch Civil War in northern New Jersey and southern New York. And the last announcement for now is that on October 16th at 10 a.m., our touring historical New Jersey program continues with a visit to the African American Museum in Atlantic City. Ralph Hunter, who is the museum's founder, will be giving us a private guided tour. Then we break for lunch and the Historical Society President, Jeffrey Schenker, will guide us through the Atlantic City Civil Rights Garden. Again, all of the details that you need are on our website, oceancountyhistory.org. With all of that, on to today's event. We are here today with Mr. Rick Gefkin, who is here to discuss the history of slavery in New Jersey. Rick has written numerous articles on various aspects of New Jersey history for local newspapers, magazines, and newsletters. He's an energetic and always popular speaker who has spoken at the New Jersey History and Historic Preservation Symposia, Rutgers and Monmouth Universities, and dozens of libraries and historical societies throughout the Garden State. He has written several books, the most recent of which is Stories of Slavery in New Jersey. So Rick will speak for about 45 minutes, after which we will have Q&A. However, I'm told that if you have a burning question that cannot wait until the end, Rick is willing to pause to answer if you want to kind of raise your hand or use the chat function. So with those announcements, any questions for me before we dive in? Okay, well, with that, I will turn it over to you, Rick. Well, thanks very much, Melissa. And tell me if I, if my slide show is going to come up here for you. Can you see that? That yes. looks perfect. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for spending a otherwise beautiful late, late, late summer day with us. Um, you can see the uh, the stories we're going to talk about today uh, from my latest book, which came out uh, from the History Press in January. And this is a little bit of a homecoming for me because years and years ago, before I started to get uh, too serious about historical studies, I knew Pauline Miller uh, at Ocean County Historical Society. I think she was one of your founders, a really terrific person. So I'm pleased to, uh, to come to you again. Um, 
as you see from our title here, New Jersey, embarrassingly enough, was the last northern state to abolish slavery, which came as a complete shock to me since I went through all of my schooling in New Jersey and no one ever mentioned anything about slavery. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to highlight some of the uh, topics of the book, certainly not everything. And um, as, as uh, Melissa mentioned, uh, if you have a question, uh, rather than save it to the end, if you'd like, uh, either raise your hand through the chat or however, and Melissa will interrupt me and allow you to ask that question. So let's begin if we can. Um, I'm sure that a lot of you, if not every one of us, have seen this historic picture painting of George Washington and these men crossing the Delaware from what would have been Pennsylvania here at a place called McConkie's Ferry over through the Delaware River to the Jersey Shore. Happened to be Christmas Eve of 1776. They're on their way down to confront the British in Trenton at the Battle of Trenton, as it turned out. Um, and it's, it's not, a real picture. It's apocryphal because uh, the artist painted this, you know, 75 or so years later, so he wasn't there. But what you may not have ever seen, nor did I, as many times as we've seen this wonderful, this wonderful historic and patriotic image, is that um, although you know by background what was happening, right, these men were fighting for life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, the question I have to pose is, that's great, but who's? And the real answer is they were fighting for white landowners, basically, uh, against the British. And they, they were objecting to taxation and a lot of other things that they didn't like. Um, but again, if you look closely at this image, uh, right there in front of George standing up is a black man. Now, he may be, uh, and the artist may have known something uh, of historic interesting uh, interest to us. Because in fact, uh, George Washington was very associated with, with a particular African American man. And that man is again uh, pictured in this image. He's right here, uh, attending to George Washington's horse in some battle somewhere. Uh, you should know, I think, that uh, New Jersey is sometimes called the crossroads of the revolution since more battles were fought in New Jersey during the Revolutionary War than, ever, than anywhere else uh, in, the, in the colonies. Uh, but that man right there with the horse is actually uh, a person named William or Billy Lee, as George called him. Um, and what's ironic about this French image, as it turns out, about this man is that he was George Washington's slave. Um, and more ironic to me is that George Washington here in this imaginary image is holding a copy of the Declaration of Independence. And certainly his faithful attendant and personal slave, uh, Billy Lee, was anything but independent. Uh, he was with the, the commander in chief in those days, General Washington, all throughout the war and later on. And as you can see here, he took care of all his personal needs, uh, not only his horses, but he cooked his meal, took messages back and forth, set up his battle tent wherever they were, uh, and they developed a close relationship. Turns out that George had bought him several years before the Revolutionary War for 61 colonial pounds at the time. Um, and to give you an idea what that meant, around that time, for that amount of money, you could buy eight horses, 13 cows, or down here, if you were a skilled tradesman, a, you know, perhaps a blacksmith or a shipwright or something, it would take you the better part of two years to earn that kind of money. And I use those uh, comparisons to show you and to illustrate that enslaved African Americans were considered property by white slaveholders, not just in New Jersey, of course, but everywhere in the original 13 colonies and the Caribbean colonies as well. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, Billy Lee was with George during the entirety of the Revolutionary War and after. Uh, after the war was successfully prosecuted and we became a, a free and independent country, um, Billy Lee was taken with George down to Mount Vernon into retirement before George became president. Um, and around that same time, Billy Lee had met a woman, uh, another black woman, and he wanted to marry her. And he asked George's permission to bring her down to Mount Vernon. And in spite of their years of togetherness, Washington hesitated 
He wasn't convinced that he could he could do that. Now, the people in Mount Vernon say that there's no record that the woman, Margaret Thomas, ever showed up down there. So it suggested perhaps she died. But still, you would think that George Washington would have enough uh, close, uh, close and personal relationship with this man to not even think for a second about bringing him down. Uh, we know that Billy Lee spent the rest of his life at Mount Vernon in service to the Washingtons. A um, little bit of background about Mount Vernon. Uh, another made up image, if you will, showing what looked to be very well fed and refreshed and you know, probably happy slaves. Uh, probably couldn't be further from the truth uh, because the Washingtons, like so many other of the landed gentry in those days, uh, treated slaves as machines basically to help them make their own money. Uh, matter of fact, um, when George died in 1799, there were over 300 enslaved Africans at his uh, estate. Now, it's interesting what happens with these folks uh, over time. Here's another image, by the way, of Billy Lee in the background. That's Martha Washington. These are her two natural grandchildren. She had been married before. Her husband, a man named Custis, had died. Um, but George Washington adopted these two children as his own. Uh, and they were, in turn, given their own personal slaves, by the way. But the point here is that Billy Lee was with the Washingtons throughout their lives. And yet, he was the only of the over 300 slaves freed in George Washington by his will uh, of all the others. Now, in fairness, George Washington didn't have complete control of all 300 because, as I mentioned, Martha, when she was a Custis, brought 84 slaves into the marriage with George. And by law at the time, they were called dower slaves. She could not or he could not free them even if he had wanted to. Um, despite that, um, by the time uh, Martha died in the early 19th century, she only saw fit to free one of those enslaved people. So two out of over 300, kind of incredible when you think about this. Um, and by the way, uh, here's a younger painting of Martha before, you know, she married George, of course. And look at that, at that um, statement from her. She was not at all inclined to look kindly at the enslaved people. And the irony of this statement, of course, is she's looking for gratitude for people whose very lives she controlled and bought and sold at will. So uh, why she would think they would be grateful is a whole nother question. Several of her slaves, including a woman named Ona Judge, ran away from her, uh, which she pursued for years. Um, want to segue to another very famous founding father of our country. You may not recognize him from this image, but he is connected also with New Jersey, surprisingly. And that man is actually William Penn. Now, it turns out that William Penn, in spite of what you may have heard, which we all were taught in grade school and high school, that he was this benevolent man to the Indians and everybody else, uh, in fact, was a slave holder as well. Uh, he was, I think you know, a brief biography here, a uh, founder of Philadelphia, but he also, which you may not have known, bought at one time first West Jersey with a uh, conglomeration of other men, and then later East Jersey. Our state was separated into two provinces way back when in the 17th century. So in effect, William Penn at one time owned all of New Jersey. And what's interesting about that is, although he was a Quaker, Early Quakers were just like every other businessman in the, in the early days of the uh, col colonial America. Uh, a lot of them, frankly, were slaveholders and they weren't advocating abolition at the beginning much. Um, brings us to this man, a guy named Lewis Morris, owned an estate up here in Monmouth County. You, I'm certain you've heard of Tinton Falls. And in his 1691 will, just before he died, Lewis Morris bequeaths a slave named Yaf, who had been his personal servant in Barbados, where he made his fortune and then moved up here, to William Penn. And that's because they were old family friends. In fact, Lewis Morris served under William Penn's father, who was a British admiral during the uh, wars of the English succession down in the Caribbean. So they knew each other by family. And as an incentive to get 
William Penn back to America, uh, Lewis Morris puts in his will that he could have this slave. Now, the backstory is that after the founding of Philadelphia, Penn, just a businessman, went back to London and was there. And so Lewis Morris wanted to encourage him to come back to uh, America. And so in the will, he gives him this slave. And as a matter of fact, in 1699, William Penn does come back and the nephew and an, an heir of the original Lewis Morris, also named Lewis Morris, in fact, gives this man Yaff to William Penn. Um, and we know quite a lot about this man. It's really kind of interesting as I looked into his, his life. Uh, he was with Yaff, uh, with Penn rather, for at least four years. We have a, a letter, a copy of a letter that William Penn wrote back from London talking about how he was going to free Yaff who had been with him. Um, uh, and this Yaff, yeah, this guy that we believe is born in Africa and spent 20 years in Barbados with the original Lewis Morris, had this fascinating life with all these very, very famous men while he was enslaved. So that gave you a little flavor of how the rich and famous back in the early days of colonial America were slaveholders, but I haven't told you yet how it all began in New Jersey. So here we go. And slavery was introduced very, very early into our state, before it was a state, obviously, by Dutch uh, poltroons. Okay. And these were uh, men uh, who were given big pieces of land across the river from Manhattan, which, as you probably know, was owned as was New Jersey and some of Connecticut by the Dutch in the early part of the 17th century. And in order to encourage settlement and agricultural uh, holdings in what became New Jersey, uh, what was then East Jersey, the Dutch patroons were given 16 mile long swaths of land um, in a place called Bergen Neck. Now to orient you on that, here's an old map. Here is what was then um, New Amsterdam, okay? Right down there's the battery. Here's what the Dutch called the North River, later the Hudson's River. And here on Bergen Neck, which is now Jersey City, and a place called Bayonne that Melissa may have heard of, uh, is where these Dutch patroons were uh, given, with the aid of the uh, uh, West India Company, slaves in order to develop this land. Now, it turns out that here in this little village of Bergen, Okay, which happened to be about three blocks from where I went to college in Jersey City at St. Peter's, was where Jersey City started. This was all then Bergen County, it's now Hudson County. And so the slaves were introduced to that part of our state very early in the 17th century. And as you can tell from maybe this map, uh, the, the root of, of slavery was really not the way we come to think of it these days. African slaves taken by European shipholders, originally came into particularly Brazil, South America, Central America, and the Caribbean before they came up here. Uh, but as the Dutch saw the opportunity to bring uh, slaves into this part of the world, uh, they did so uh, with uh, some alacrity. Now, a few years later, a couple decades later, actually, in 1664, these two guys, come in control of New Jersey. And that's because the English take over from the Dutch in 1664. And you know them as Berkeley and Carteret. Now, in what is considered the founding document of New Jersey, something called the Concession and Agreement of the Lord's Proprietors, these two guys who split the state, they were giving to any white person, English people coming over to colonize East and West Jersey, 75 acres per slave. They were given 150 acres per white person, but additionally, 75 free acres of land for every slave they brought in. So basically, the founding document of New Jersey incorporates slavery into our state uh, in the mid 17th century. So both in what was then Bergen, up North County, uh, up in Northern New Jersey, rather, and down here in Monmouth County, as you'll see, Slavery gets a foothold very, very early in our state. Now, what these two men are responding to is this guy. He's the Duke of York, after whom they named New York, by the way. He's the brother of 
um, King James, who gives him a huge part of land here as a reward after the, the English Civil Wars. And it turns out that in 1660, James, uh, Duke of York, um, was the um, original stockholder in something called the Royal African Company. And you can see here a couple of African men in their corporate seal and an elephant. And that company was founded specifically to go down the coast of Africa to trade in European goods for people and then transport these people to the new world. So these men are not only encouraging slaves to come into the new world to help establish agricultural um, farms, huge pieces of land, especially in New Jersey, but they're also nodding to their patron who is James Duke of York. And, you know, in a, in a kind of dastardly one hand washed to the other kind of scheme. Um, and it turns out that they were very successful in this endeavor because the Caribbean, as I mentioned, were the islands that were controlled by the British were full of uh, Englishmen who were slaveholders. Even as you could tell in this image, early Quakers, you see some slaves in the background here. This is a, uh, an image of tobacco farmers in Barbados. Barbados was one of the primary tobacco plantations of the new world and then transitioned to sugar uh, by the end of the 17th century. At which point men like Lewis Morris that we mentioned who had with his brother Richard established very, very successful sugar plantations, came up to New York and New Jersey uh, to found even more uh, plantation wealth up here. And one of those men, as you already know, is Lewis Morris. Um, and he came to Tenton Falls specifically because it had a large waterfall here so he could power his mills so his slaves could grind they called it corn, but it was a catch-all phrase for any kind of grain, corn and wheat and anything else, so they could sell it to New York. And if you look back here, by the way, in this old map again, you kind of turn your head. This peninsula between the Hackensack and the Passaic Rivers was actually called New Barbados um, because so many Barbadian planters had moved up there, many with their own slaves. So again, by around 1700, slavery is everywhere in what becomes the state of New Jersey. So you'll find this, I think, interesting too. In a very, very early census record, 1737 of our state, with very few counties, we didn't even have 21 counties yet, the white population is here, Negroes and other slaves, and those would be primarily Lenape Indian slaves, are here. Now, overall, at that time, there's about 4,000 slaves in the entirety of New Jersey in 1737, represents about 8% of the total population. But if you look here, and remember that until 1850, Monmouth County included what is now Ocean County, okay, is significantly higher. In all of Monmouth County, the slaves account for about 11% of the overall population only exceeded by Bergen County, as I already mentioned, which is up north and where the Dutch were. So the English and Dutch too were bringing slaves in in pretty big numbers uh, to um, what is now Monmouth Ocean County very early on. Now these numbers started to scare, believe it or not, the white slaveholders because they were very keenly aware because they still traded a lot with the Caribbean of all of the slavery rebellions Jamaica, certainly in Haiti and all over the place. And they were afraid that as the slave population grew, that they would rebel. And they were right to be afraid because that's exactly what happened. A couple of years later, as a matter of fact, after this census was taken in New York in 1741, there was a slave rebellion, which was put down brutally by the English authorities, burned people at the stake, hanged people, drawn and quartered people. Um, and these little revolts were happening with some frequency pretty much everywhere. Uh, and in the book, I talk about a number that happened in New Jersey as well. Now, slavery having gotten a foothold both in North and I guess what we would consider Central Jersey, Monmouth Ocean County, also in the Western part of our state gets a foothold very early. Uh, and that has to do with 
uh, a couple of people, one of which is this man who was originally from Philadelphia named William Trent. Uh, and it turns out that William Trent made a lot of his money working as a Quaker slaveholder in Philadelphia by trading in goods and people to Caribbean ports. And by the time 1719 comes along, he decides to have a country estate built, which is pictured right here, this house on what was the western, uh, uh, should be the eastern side of the Delaware River in western New Jersey. And he has his country estate. And not only that, he takes over some existing mills and has his slaves uh, work these mills and he becomes even more rich. And as you can tell, of course, Trent, Trent's town evolves eventually to Trenton, which becomes uh, eventually to our state capital. So early on, uh, slavery is in that part of our state. But this man, too, comes into play with that particular house. And that is a painting of <coughs> uh, Lewis Morris, the nephew of the original Lewis Morris. <coughs> and what he, uh, his claim to fame, among other things, is that he becomes very wealthy and becomes the first colonial royal governor of New Jersey in 1742. He had inherited this vast 3,000 acre estate in Tinton Falls from his uncle. And when he becomes governor, he decides to move the government over here to West Jersey. And he engages with the governor of Pennsylvania who now owns this house, a guy named Governor Thomas, because William Trent's dead at that point. And he wants to rent this house to conduct government business. And here's a letter in 1742 from Lewis Morris to the governor. And in the letter, he says, hey, I want to come over and rent that house we talked about, but I need you to build a kitchen wing to lodge my servants. Now, what he's talking about in this letter is his slaves that are in Tinton Falls with him. And the reason he's doing this is that his wife, Isabella, basically said, listen, Lou, I'm not going over there to cook and take care of you. I'll go over to Trenton but I want our slaves, some of our slaves to go with us, to attend to us. And oh, by the way, they're not gonna live with us. We're gonna build a kitchen out back. Now they would have done that probably anyway, because in colonial times, if you were rich enough, you had an outbuilding for a kitchen to, you know, to avoid fire in your home. And that's what happens. Governor Thomas, in fact, builds a home, or I should say an annex to their house as a kitchen and where the slaves live. And so again, by 1740, slaves are now in what becomes our state capital. Now that building here is still extant and some of you may have been to it. It is the William Trent Museum right there and you can see it. Um, uh, Melissa's been there, I've been there and an associate of ours at now a dean at Monmouth University, Rich Veit, has been over the years conducting archeological researches on their grounds here in the front because that kitchen building is long gone. Um, and I happened to go there a couple of years ago, and here are uh, here is an image of one of the things they found. Now, I don't know yet, the report hasn't been published, if this is the actual foundation to the kitchen, and they may have found it in this season for all I know, but if it is, it'll be very interesting because slaves typically left behind cultural artifacts. So when the report is finally published, when they examine what they find, if anything, we may learn a little bit more about these slaves that uh, Lewis Morris brought over, including if any of them are old enough or young enough in that case to have come from Barbados, we might learn about their religious practices or some of their superstitions, depending upon how you look at it. Uh, but once again, Lewis Morris is key to understanding slavery, certainly in uh, Mammoth and what is now, of course, Ocean County as well. Now, um, Princeton, just up the block from uh, Trenton, if you will, uh, has a sordid history with slavery as well in West Jersey. Uh, and that has a lot to do with the Stockton family that I'm sure you've heard about. Uh, Richard Stockton, the uh, progenitor of the family, actually, and once again, we see William Penn, early in the 18th century, bought a huge number of acres to develop uh, his farm and his livelihood in what became Princeton. Um, and he had a lot of slaves to help him build his family fortune. Now here's a map several years later of the greater Princeton area. A lot of you know Alexander Street and some of these other areas there. 
Uh, and it turns out that Princeton University was actually founded by the original Richard Stockton's grandson, pictured here, also named Richard Stockton. Interesting guy, this Richard Stockton uh, not only inherited Morvan, okay, which was the uh, family estate, which by the way is, looks kind of like that. And you know, right here, if you've been there, Morvan is, is still a really good place to visit. I don't know what the pandemic situation is now, but they have done a good job, by the way, exhibiting their debt to the African-American slaves that built that estate. Richard Morvan, during the Revolutionary War, fights the British, gets captured, and is a prisoner of war, and because of the harsh treatment that he endures, dies and leaves his estate and all its slaves, of course, during the Revolution, to his wife. Now, Richard Stockton, like upwards of 30 of the men that signed the original Declaration of Independence were slaveholders. Pretty sure you know that. But his wife does something truly amazing. And there she is. Uh, Anas Abudna was her, her original name, obviously a French extraction. When he dies and she inherits the estate, she does what is emblematic to me of how um, interesting slaveholders view these people. They view them mostly as not people, but yet they do interesting things. And I'll let you read what Annas did after her husband died. Kind of startling. And the background is that one of her slaves died in childbirth and Anna Stockton had young children that she was uh, wet nursing. And she began to wet nurse this slave, Marcus Marsh, who stayed with her the rest of her life until she finally emanuated him. So we have this kind of back and forth of terrible cruelty that slaveholders inflicted on their, their human chattel. And then you have acts like this that defy the times. And that's not just common among you know, rich people, but we see that time and time again, not, not wet nursing necessarily, but kindnesses to and, and uh, enslaved people. So people were always very up in the air about how to treat their slaves. Although it's fair to say they mostly didn't treat them too well. Now we've talked so far about kind of the rich and famous, but it didn't take long for people in what we would call middle class, kind of like most of us, I would imagine, uh, embrace slavery as well in early New Jersey. And these two men in particular are notorious for some of the things they did. Um, on the left, you have Charles Morgan. There's a town up here near Lawrence Harbor called Morgan. That's where his family's from originally. Um, and to the right is his brother-in-law, a guy named Jacob Van Wickle, who was a magistrate up here in Middlesex County, up there in Middlesex County as well. And what these two guys do is just incredible. Um, turns out that they uh, basically hoodwinked and defrauded African-Americans and sold them into slavery. And they didn't do it uh, out of whole cloth because it turns out that uh, Charles' father, James, who also served against uh, fighting against the British during the Revolutionary War, knew enough about slavery to make money. In this case, it was an aid he took out to try to return to reward a runaway slave. So the Morgan family knew a lot about slaves. They had their own slaves. Um, and what they do, these two men in 1818, uh, is to create basically a kidnapping ring. And they're responding to a law that New Jersey passed uh, in 1804 called the Act for the Gradual Abolition of Slavery. And that law stated that although we weren't quite ready as a, as a, uh, a state to free slaves, eventually they would be. And that means that if you were a male slave born in 1804, you would be freed after 25 years of, of servitude to your master, a female 21 years. So that had the effect of making slaves as property worth less money, because of course they're gonna be freed at some point and you have to free them you have to register them with the county. You have no choice. So these two guys come up with a scheme. And what they do is they lure both free, mostly free uh, black people in New Jersey to the judge's house. And they say, listen, 
There's a lot of great jobs down south for you in the, all this plantation economy, cotton and all these other things. And uh, we will at our expense ship you down there and you could start your lives all over again. And then they have them because it's a law, uh, sign these phony consent forms saying they understand. And of course, what they really do is they put them on boats out of Perth Amboy and they ship them down around to um, New Orleans and they sell them into slavery. At least we know by record 137 what are called free Negroes are shipped down to Louisiana, uh, sold and in some cases kept by Charles Morgan at his plantation, which he immodestly called Morganza, which is near Baton Rouge. Um, and it's this horrendous crime that they do. Uh, they get caught, by the way, by the authorities in New Jersey, but nothing happens. No one involved in the scheme gets, even though they get indicted, gets accused or convicted of anything, uh, and they all but make a bunch of money. Now, uh, we know these things, uh, a lot of it's lost to, to contemporary history because it was known for years, and here's an old newspaper clipping, of how these po people tricked these black folks into uh, being sold into slavery. Now, it was very early, as far as we know, none of these slaves then survived in through emancipation in 1865 or returned to New Jersey. We don't know about that. But through DNA studies, there are a group of people who have traced their ancestry to these people. Their relatives still live in Mississippi and Louisiana, places like that. And if you go online and have the interest, there's a something called the Lost Souls Public Memorial Project. And they have recorded now many more than 137 of these free blacks that were sold into slavery. Uh, and they've put up a plaque up in uh, uh, New Brunswick and some other places up north. So it's an interesting thing to look at. I know some of the folks and they've done really good uh, genealogy research to find out about these folks. But again, it's an example of how even middle-class folks jump on the bandwagon of how they can make money from slavery uh, before emancipation. Now, um, so far we've talked about white slaveholders, but I wanna talk a little bit if I can uh, about the effect on black people, especially these two people. Uh, Charles and Hannah Reeves were two people born into slavery in Middletown, New Jersey, up here in Monmouth County. Charles was born at 1820 and by his name, we assume he may have been owned or his family had been owned by English people at one point uh, or English descendants. Um, we do know that he was uh, enslaved on, uh, at a, a, by a man named David Williamson, who was of Dutch origin actually. Uh, and this house is still extant on Newman Springs Road in what is now Holmdel. That's where Charles uh, was owned. He falls in love later in his life with a woman whose last name Van Cleef is clearly Dutch. We think she may also have come up. Uh, we know she was born enslaved in Middletown uh, years after him, but she may have been part of uh, the family uh, here, the Taylor family who owned Van Cleef slaves in Middletown as well. That's not been documented quite yet. But what's interesting about their marriage is a few things. They lived in this shack, which was on Middletown Lincroft Road, for many years after they were married. And in fact, four generations of their family were raised in that dirt floor shack here in New Jersey. Now, again, their life was influenced by the 1804 Act for the Gradual Abolition of Slavery. Charles would have been manumitted sometime around 1845. Hannah Van Cleef about 1850. And that lines up very well with when they got married. And their uh, descendants have given me a copy of their marriage certificate. They got married in the Homedale Baptist Church, then part of Middletown in 1850. And here's their marriage certificate. Soon thereafter, and for several years after they had 11 children, they raised in this house, when Charles was free, he worked for other local farmers for the rest of his life. They became very prominent citizens despite their very humble beginnings, well-respected throughout town, uh, would walk on Sundays over the bridge into Red Bank to uh, worship at the Baptist church there. Uh, 
and became very, very well known locally. And their descendants who shared most of this information with me have in, in like a manner become very successful. And I got lucky in my life to learn this because of a very, very uh, wonderful woman that I'll talk to you about in a minute. Their life, by the way, Hannah and Charles is also influenced by the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law. This was a federal law that the Southern legislatures had pushed through Congress because so many of the slaves now South were running away all the time up North to try to be free, that this law was put into place, which said that anybody helping escaped slaves escape further or to free them uh, was subject to severe penalties and jail, as a matter of fact. And this encouraged slave uh, catchers to come North and grab anybody they could, free or enslaved Blacks, and bring them back and sell them for rewards into the South. So it's pretty well documented that, and probably Charles uh, got married in 1850 to get some legal standing with Hannah so that they would have at least one piece of paper to show that they were not ever, uh, or they had been, but were no longer enslaved. Because as I mentioned, the slave catchers are taking black people literally off the streets, whatever their status and bringing them back down south. Um, another thing happened in 1850 that's very, very interesting. Up here in Lincroft, another part of Middletown, next to what is today St. Leo the Great Church, was sold a piece of property in 1850 of two acres by a white man to 14 free black men. And we know that Charles Reeves also bought part of this as again to get a piece of property deed to enable him to prove that he was a free man. Now I'm on part of a committee with some other folks uh, restoring this very historic cemetery uh, up here in, uh, in Lincroft. But we do know that this segment right there in what is now the uh, part of the cemetery was, uh, cemetery was owned by Charles Reeve, Reeves and his family. And this is what that plot looks like today. Uh, that's Charles and Hannah's uh, grave site. Uh, several of their children and other descendants are buried here. Now, as I mentioned, I know all of this information and more that I've written about in the book because I was lucky enough to meet this wonderful woman, Mae Edwards. In fact, I dedicated my book to her because without her, I wouldn't have a book. Uh, when I met her in the last several years of her life, she uh, shared all this very, uh, very fascinating information about her family. She is Charles and Hannah's, was Charles and Hannah's great granddaughter. She grew up in that shack I showed you, as did four generations of her family. Uh, she worked as a nurse in Riverview Hospital up here for her career for 40 years and rose to become president of the African American Genealogical and Historical Society of New Jersey. And alerted me, a white person, to something I never knew, that many, many black families in New Jersey and elsewhere do in fact know their history and genealogy very well back to slave times. I had always assumed that all those records are lost. So uh, just a fabulous person I was fortunate to meet to share this, uh, this heritage with me. Um, as I mentioned, the Fugitive Slave Act was a result of so many escaped slaves running away. And these are, you've seen images like this, I hope, many, many newspaper images of people that would run away with literally the clothes on their back and a satchel full of whatever else they could take with them and, and they would try to come north. And in our state, most of the, uh, what became known as the Underground Railroad would sort of up the west side of the state. They'd get to around Trenton, Princeton area where it's thin, cut across, try to get to Staten Island or New York City and then up to Hudson to Canada if they could. And you probably do know that a lot of these red marked places, uh, red outlines are where there are still houses that uh, so-called conductors of the Underground Railroad help these escapees. Notice, by the way, that in the, our side of the state, there are not many uh, places. Now, that's not to say that slaves did not run away and find their way through the eastern part of New Jersey, Tom's River, and north of, of where you all are. But uh, the quickest route, if you were an escaped slave from the south, was up this way, up the river. 
uh, of course there are people here that were escaping. We have documentation that thousands of slaves ran away to the British side during the Revolutionary War from all sections of New Jersey because the British were planning to set them free. As a matter of fact, they wound up in Nova Scotia to a large degree. Uh, but to get back to the Underground Railroad, you know, of course, that the most famous conductor of the Underground Railroad is this woman, largely associated with New Jersey, although she wasn't born here. Uh, as a matter of fact, she wasn't born under that name either. Am or, uh, Araminta or Minty Ross uh, was born in Maryland. She adopted her mother's name and her, her husband's name, of course, Tubman, later on in her life. Uh, but she was born in a plantation in Maryland, escaped up originally to Philadelphia, um, uh, worked, we think, for some time as a housemaid uh, in a hotel, by the way, in Cape May, uh, but spent years going back in disguise, freeing other enslaved people from uh, particularly Maryland. Originally went back to free her husband, who had remarried, thinking that she had died. She did free her parents. And uh, we think as many as 70 people uh, after her escape to, uh, to uh, Philadelphia. Just a marvelous story, as I think, I think you know about. Led at least this many uh, people, or I should say excursions, including infiltrating during the war, Civil War, Confederate Army camps in disguise. Um, after the war, she retires, remarries, goes up to uh, Auburn, New York, and doesn't stop a uh, woman with boundless energy. She be she opens up a home for aged ex-slaves. She's part of the nascent uh, votes for women movement, just an incredible human being uh, who dies very early in the 20th century. And if we're fortunate, and I hope we will be now that uh, some things have changed in Washington, uh, it may be that over time, we'll find a way to honor her uh, on uh, where she at least belongs on some United States currency. Uh, but we'll see if that eventuates. But uh, I devoted a chapter to her in the book, be and, and there's many books that have been written about this, uh, this brave, uh, courageous woman. Now, winding up here a little, how did uh, New Jersey approach abolition eventually? And as you see, agonizingly slowly, uh, I mentioned before that when er, early in the 18th century, slaveholders were afraid of slave rebellions, they cracked down with a series of laws. And this is just one that was incredibly brutal. Uh, if you were a slave found within uh, outside of five miles, from, within five miles of your master's home without a permission slip, you could be whipped, returned or even killed uh, and the white person that returned you would, would be rewarded. Um, if you freed your slaves as a white slaveholder, you had to, by law, provide 200 colonial pounds to the government and also 20 more pounds per year for every life every year that slave lived. Uh, that, by the way, is about $38,000. It's put into the law specifically because nobody's gonna do that. Nobody's gonna give away a slave and have to pay that kind of money. And that's why it's there. As I mentioned, this law was passed in 1804, uh, but it was very restrictive and kept uh, people as slaves for a long time, a third of their lives generally. In 1844, in one of our first constitutions, we say, echoing the De Declaration of Independence, all men are free and independent. Well, the slaveholders that were still existing in New Jersey, though limited in number, decided they didn't like that. They brought this to the Supreme Court who overturned that provision in the law and said, oh, sorry, we only meant white men. We didn't mean uh, black people and we certainly didn't mean women. Uh, we meant landed uh, men. Now, uh, 1846, New Jersey tries once again, passes something called the Act to Abolish Slavery not quite as good as it sounds either, because it said that if you were a slave that year, you had to serve as an apprentice for your life with your master. So the name changes, but your conditions don't necessarily change. Nonetheless, fewer slaveholders and fewer slaves, as we look at census records, appear. Uh, in 1860, there's about 18 slaves listed 
as slaves in the New Jersey census record. Although the truth is that because of this act, some of the, some of the black people listed are apprentices and they're really enslaved. Um, so there's probably several hundred left at the outbreak of the Civil War, um, which as you know, precipitates the end of slavery. Uh, how does it do that? Well, surprisingly also, by the way, New Jersey in both 1860 and 1864 was the only Northern state to vote against Lincoln. Uh, we didn't give our, our votes to, to him during that time. When he's inaugurated, everybody gets all excited down South, you know, South Carolina secedes, the Civil War begins. In 1863, Lincoln issues the Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation which I hope you remember only frees the slaves in the states of rebellion because he couldn't as president, he did not have the right under law to free slaves, however few in the Northern states because they were considered property and the federal government couldn't do that. But the slaves that had broken away no longer fell under our jurisdiction. So he issued that emancipation proclamation. Uh, took another couple of years for the war to end. And then the 13th amendment, ratified by the then three quarters of the number of states in the country is passed in December of 1865, finally and forever abolishes slavery. But New Jersey is the last one. It took us another month for our legislature to get behind this and we didn't want to. The legislature had fierce debates because of the entrenched powers who wanted to continue with slavery. And it was kind of a, well, we got to go along with this. It's a fait accompli. And so we are the last Northern state to do that. Um, another 150 years goes by before our legislature in 2008 passes an apology for slavery. Uh, nice gesture, but there's something missing. And what's missing is there's no mention of reparations to any descendants of any enslaved folks. And you all know through redlining and a lot of other horrendous things that have happened in the time since emancipation and finally a manumission that um, this topic has been debated and will continue to be debated as it should be, I think. Uh, and we'll see how it eventuates over the next few years uh, to in some small ways make up for what was basically uh, 250 years or more of slavery in our state. Now, last thing before we open up questions is that I'm part of a project, as is Melissa, that started out being called the New Jersey Slavery Records Index, but now it's called the Northeast Slavery Records Index. And what we're doing is collecting records of slaves, slave ships, owners of slaves, free slaves, any mention of slaves, and putting them into a free database that'll be used by researchers and um, genealogists and hopefully by black families to try to figure out who their uh, you know, uh, ancestors might have been. Uh, and here's the URL, you can look at that if you like. It now enta entails all of the states in the Northeast. Uh, Monmouth University is sponsoring the New Jersey part of it. Uh, so it's an exciting, what will become a multi-year project uh, that I hope you can uh, you can help us with at some point. Uh, so that's it. I'll open it up through Melissa to questions. But uh, if you would like to get a, a signed and dedicated copy of my book, uh, you can get a hold of me at this email, rickg0817 at Yahoo. And I can sign it and ship it to you uh, if you want to be uh, to give away a copy of the book or just to read it for yourself. There are Pretty much I touched on every county in New Jersey to give a little bit of the history of, uh, of slavery. And I put in a 12 page bibliography because I'm giving you uh, little snippets of information here, but there've been many scholars before me, white and black who've done really terrific work on the history of slavery up here in the Garden State. So with that, Melissa, if you wanna open up the questions, I'd be, uh, I'd be happy to do that. Certainly. Well, thank you so much. Let me give a round of applause. And I'm sure everyone is clapping at home too for Rick's really um, profound delivery of this important information. Uh, you all have the power to unmute yourselves. If you would like to ask a question, please feel free to do that. 
Alternately, if you would like to type your question in the chat, I would be happy to read it for you. Give everyone a second to find their mute buttons or unmute buttons. Or we could go enjoy a really nice late summer day. <laughs> no, we can't let you go that easy, Rick. Uh, <laughs> let me ask you this while people are perhaps looking for their unmute button or, or formulating their questions. Um, this is obviously very timely, very important work. This is the direction we see scholarship going. But have you in your talks out in the community gotten any pushback from people who say, why are you bringing this up or, you know, we should. Be That's a really good question. I think it's an important question. And, you know, almost by default, the fact that people like today's group attends uh, lectures and talks like this, uh, people are interested in it. So not many people on these talks that I've been given since January when the book came out, uh, push back too much. You know, what the general tenor is out there, as you would expect, would be uh, like everywhere else in the country. There are some people that wish this history was buried and other people that are interested in finding out. Like anybody that was educated in New Jersey uh, of, of certainly my demographic, and I'll bet people on this uh, talk today, we were never taught anything. It's only in the last several years that schools are teaching a segment of what they're calling African-American history, but it's a block, a little piece of history for grade school and high school kids that uh, if it mentions slavery, gives it a cursory glance. Uh, you know, the, one of the reasons I did this book was because I was surprised to find out, having been educated, that nobody ever mentioned it. And it's important. Uh, I don't think we can progress as a country and as a culture without understanding what the attitudes of today are without knowing what our history was. And so uh, I've gotten a lot of very nice comments from folks. Um, and, you know, I, I did a lot of time on the research of this book. To my knowledge, there's nothing in there that I can't back up uh, with factual research uh, or I wouldn't have put it in the book. So, you know, deniers are what they are, uh, but this is stuff that we have to face, I think, painfully and uh, maybe build a better society with it. Mm, very, very well said, Rick. I have a question here in the chat, and this is rather specific, so you may not know off the top of your head, but it's a good question. Is there any evidence that the Applegate family that ran the grist mill adjacent to the Morris Iron Works in Tinton Falls had or used slave labor in the 1670s? So that is a great question. Now, what, who, who asked the question so I can talk to him? There's no name associated with it. Oh, okay. So wh whomever, um, you probably do know by the tone of the question that um, Applegate and a man named James Grover and another man whose name I conveniently, oh, a Tilton, founded um, a, uh, actually founded the original iron mill that Lewis Morris wound up financing, the original Lewis Morris and taking over. Um, Early on in that group of men, and they had migrated, by the way, from Gravesend in Brooklyn, uh, now Brooklyn, to come over and, and begin. They were the original 12, part of the original 12 patentees of Monmouth County. Uh, they uh, were influential, but so far in my researches, they didn't have enough wherewithal to purchase slaves themselves. Now, that said, I've been doing a project with the Grover family. Grovers are very, very much associated with the Applegates in the early uh, men around that time, 1670. Uh, the early Grovers, to my knowledge, did not have en enslaved folks. Applegates, I don't know specifically, but if you send me an email, I'll turn you out to some things I do know. I believe that these early uh, men, they were 12 men that Pat Deesa came over, they're, none of them had enough money, frankly. They were so busy settling uh, to own slaves, but their family, certainly two generations later, I know that the Grovers had slaves. So some of the Applegates may have. The early records are very, very tough to get into unless there's a specific mention in a will. It's very difficult to know who had slaves very early. Uh, 
but it's a terrific question. Suffice it to say that if you were uh, early in or to the mid 18th century, if you had a decent sized, and they call them plantations too, agricultural concern, you almost had to get slaves because you didn't have enough white labor uh, to, to conduct your business. So by the 1730s, uh, a lot of these folks who are good sized landholders were slave holders too. Great question. Good answer, Rick. Thank you. Um, someone asked to see the New York project information again. Just okay. an FYI for everyone. I put that in the chat. So oh, great. Go in the chat and you can copy and paste that right now. I also put Rick's email in the chat since he kindly noted that people could reach out to him. Uh, so his email is in the chat for you also if you need it. Um, I have someone asking it is always surprising to see mention of the Quakers and slavery. Would you suggest any sources that expand more on this? Sure, sure. There's, there's a couple of, well, I, you know, I, I address it in my book. It turns out that a guy named John Woolman from West Jersey, where there were more Quakers, by the way, and more sympathy toward abolition. Uh, around the 1730s, 1740s area, the Quakers start to get really exercised about the cruelty of slavery. And uh, that bleeds over into uh, Quakers over here in Monmouth, which of course was also Ocean County in those days. Uh, Woolman comes over here, speaks at the uh, Shrewsbury meeting, uh, and the original uh, formation of, of abolition is where Quakers dis discover and decide that they won't buy any more slaves. Although I've got plenty of Quaker wills where they're freeing their older and you will used up slaves and they are passing on, bequeathing their younger, more valuable slaves to their children uh, well into the 18th century. But eventually Quaker meetings start to preach the gospel of teach your slaves how to read and write. And then certainly by the end of the uh, 18th century, they're talking and being very adamant about uh, manumitting slaves. And the Quakers to their great credit, um, really inspire many, many other people to examine uh, enslavement for the cruelty that it was. Um, and so uh, they are, uh, are, are hats off to them. Now, to the, to the question of books, uh, there's a number of books in my bibliography, uh, but you can look for John Woolman, W-O-O-L-M-A-N. You can look for, just do a Google search for Woolman. You'll find a lot of books about him and the Quaker movement, and that'll lead you to a whole bunch of other books about Quaker abolitionists uh, that people have written about. Um, really just uh, a, bra a brave stance that they took. Uh, a lot of them were, were English because uh, George Fox, who was English, began, began uh, the Society of Friends uh, and tried to influence everybody, including Lewis Morris, by the way, in Barbados, Fox visits, and then he comes up and visits the original Lewis Morris up in Tinton Falls, too. And they get into some pretty vigorous debates about, hey, Lewis, you got to free your slaves. And Morris basically says, I can't do that. This is the foundation of my wealth. I can't do it. Um, so uh, really great topic to look into. Anyone else? Anyone else, you can feel free to unmute and shout your question out or type it in the chat. Last call. Okay. All right, folks. All right, well, you, you do have also my email. So if you want to send me an email about anything specific, especially the person you asked about the Applegate family, uh, I've got a lot on them, including, a, believe it or not, I was in Florida a couple of years ago visiting my, my grown children. And I ran into a man who was an Applegate descendant who's written a book about the Applegate family. So I'll turn you on to that if you'd like as well. So uh, Melissa and Barbara and everybody else at the Ocean County Historic Society, thank you very much for today. And I look forward to seeing you all again uh, sometime real soon. Thank, thank you. you so thank much, you. Rick. And everyone remember, if you came in late and missed the beginning of Rick's remarks, or if you'd like to share this program with anyone, it'll be posted on our YouTube channel shortly. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.